Returning to Katahdin, an Appalachian Trail dream. Have you ever dreamt of hiking the AT? Bruce Matson did, so we're going to follow him every step of the way. Hi everybody and thanks so much for coming back to Returning to Katahdin, an Appalachian Trail dream, sponsored by our friends at Trailtopia. Amazingly, we're already on to episode number nine, and this one's a real treat. <laughs> well, it is for me. I have the opportunity to include my favourite snippet of sound ever from my Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail show, which is... Fear and loathing on the Appalachian Trail. Yep, fear and loathing on the Appalachian Trail. This was a short segment I used to do on the other show, where I got past guests to tell me a couple of things that they were worried about prior to departing on their adventure. I don't really know why I stopped doing it. Perhaps I'll bring it back. Anyway, I thought I'd change it up a bit for Bruce and, well, you'll hear what he may be concerned about in a minute. In the meantime, who fancies a bit of dinner? Do you remember those cold, wet evenings on the trail when you pitched up at a shelter and there was nothing you would have rather had than a beautiful, hot, home-cooked meal? Well, apart from actually going home, you could try out one of the delicious meals from Trailtopia. Why not dig into their spectacular jambalaya with its authentic Creole flavour? Or how about their beef stew, which is loaded with beef, potatoes, carrots, mushrooms, corn, green beans and green bell pepper in a fantastic beef gravy? Go on, try them. Trust me, you're going to love them. Trailtopia, the best of home cooking away from home. Last week, when we spoke with Bruce's lovely family on Christmas Day, I didn't get the chance to ask him one of your questions. So this week, I included two questions from listeners. The first was from Rick Watts, or Bible Man Rick. Or the second was from Kristen Gardena, or Crispina. I now have Kristen's address, so I need yours, Rick, in order for Trailtopia to send you out your meals. Keep them coming, folks. Bruce really likes to get these. So let's hear what's keeping Bruce up late at night before he leaves. Okay, we're back with Bruce. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, good morning. How are you today? I'm not too bad. Christmas is over. Uh, didn't it, well, actually, I did eat too much, so uh, but I didn't drink too much, which I guess is the better way around of doing things. Um, and we're going to start today. This is going to be a fear and loathing uh, episode, um, basically cribbed from my Mighty Blue and the Appalachian Trail podcast. I'll ask you about a number of fears. But I've got a couple of listener questions to start with, and we're going to start with Rick Watts, or Bible Man Rick, as he says. Um, his question is, and you, the, may, the answer may be you're not taking any, but how are you planning to have any long-term medications you're taking delivered to you while you're on the trail? Good question. Um, I, I, um, I do take a statin and a high blood pressure medication. I'm actually having uh, my annual physical a week before I leave <laughs> for the trip. Just a and week. <laughs> I'd like to say that, it, yeah, I'd like to say that uh, in, in the, the theme of my planning that I actually scheduled that just so I had it just before I left. Um, and that was a, a little bit coincidental. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have this uh, hope and uh, I'm going to make this plea to my doctor to uh, uh, let me go without my medications and uh, you know see how it goes because um, you know I, I think that my blood pressure has been really good the last uh, number of checkups and uh, the statin is uh, largely prophylactic so I'd love to uh, not take those um, but I'll I'll listen to the doctor yeah. if I need to have them supplied um cheryl will mail them to me at different mail drops so, you know, generally can have a month's supply i'd rather not carry that much but still not that much if i need to bring it make sure, make sure you don't drop them on the trail like i did my ibuprofen <laughs> i was scrambling around for 20 minutes trying to find them the thought of some poor old animal hoovering up about 20 of my ibuprofen really horrified me so <laughs> you don't yeah. want any, any of that going on i'll tell you <laughs> okay well thanks for that bible man rick now the other one which was a really long really beautiful email i received from Kristen gardella uh, who was crispina a 1999 through hiker 
She went uh, on the AT with her father. She was only 23 and her father, who had just recovered from a punctured lung, um, they completed their through hike. Uh, he was aged 62. It's a lovely email. I'm going to respond to her. And she had a nice question for you. She says, I know you like to prepare and do research, so I assume you have read every trail memoir you can find. What has been your favourite trail memoir so far? Why? And what about that person's account inspires you and your hike? And she said, she says, by the way, her favourite was back in 99 was Bill Irwin's Blind Courage. And she says, if you haven't read it, I would put that on your list immediately. Yeah, that's, a, uh, you know, I, that one I wish I'd gotten ahead of time. Um, I have read a number. Um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, if you do some research, which I've done, there's almost 300 memoirs available through wow. Amazon and other sources. Wow. So um, an awful lot of us uh, think that we can write a memoir whenever we finish a long hike. So um, <laughs> I include myself because I, as you may know, I did one about the Camino de Santiago. Yeah. But um, since I need to react rather quickly, uh, let me mention three, and two of them are well-known, and one would probably not be terribly well-known. Uh, I'll put myself in the category of being a Bill Bryson fan generally, and also being a fan of A Walk in the Woods. Um, Same here. Although that's not as much, it's not as much a memoir, so as I answer that, I probably should you know, take that off the list. The one that I think is really, really well done is Jennifer Farr Davis's memoir of, of her hike, her first yeah. through hike. Uh, right. As many people know, she's done three. Um, she obviously set a record uh, more recently, but her original hike is, it's Odessa is the name of the uh, memoir. And uh, it's, you can really tell when you read a lot of these memoirs, you know, who's got literary talent and, and who doesn't. Yeah. to be a little critical, but um, hers, you can tell, was very beautifully written, good editing, and uh, very much, I thought, captured the experience in a way that you could really appreciate different aspects of the physical and the mental aspects of the hike. Shows how much I know, because I, I thought she did the fast one first and then did the through later, but it was the other way around, was it? It was. She was She was uh, younger, she was not married, and uh, it was uh, very much a cathartic experience for her at her right. time in her life. So uh, it's really well done, I think. So I would recommend that one. Yeah. The one that jumps to mind, which I put in this category of sort of all the others, you know, lots of uh, through hikers who have taken the time to do a book, uh, is there's a book called, I think it's called, oh shoot, it's called Rethinker, or Rethinker is in the title, Oh, I remember yeah. that. I've read that one as well. I liked it. Yeah, good. And um, was it Gary I Bond? He, or was it Gary Bond? Is that the name? Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe will be. Yeah. I think his trail name was Rethinker, and Rethinking or Rethinker is in the title. Again, maybe I'll ca I'll capture it and share it with you. You can drop it in the notes, or we can mention it again. But I, it just was very meaningful to me because, as we've discussed. You know, my plan is to, you know, I really anticipate spending a little bit of time on the trail uh, thinking about life and where I've been and where I'm going. Oh, yeah. And that was certainly a, a significant theme of that book. And I thought he captured that process throughout the hike uh, particularly well. So, it's, you know, I tell you it's called. I, I tell you it's called. It's called, yeah. three, it's called Rethinking Life on the Appalachian Trail. By Gary Bond. How about that? That's a memory. <laughs> hey, I've got good. it myself. Good I read job. it myself. Yeah, and I agree with you. It was a really great book. Very, very enjoyable. You're going to hear on the Appalachian Trail a lot of um, amazingly divisive people, sorry, amazingly divided views of Bill Bryson. People either love it or they hate it with a passion. It's one of, the biggest, one of my biggest surprises, the difference in people and their attitude towards that book. It was just amazing to me. Uh, I, I've actually witnessed that recently. I, I, on Facebook, I'm on one of these sites for 2018 through hikers. Oh, yeah. And someone, someone posted a photo of the book and said, has anyone read this book? <laughs> <laughs> and there... It started this war on oh, Facebook, of course. just oh. what you said about people who feel 
very strongly in both directions about that book. So, um, <laughs> but Bryson never I claims he, he never claims he did it. He never claims he did the whole thing. He just says what he did. He wrote. He walked about eight hundred miles or whatever it was, and uh, it was funny. The film was terrible, but the book was great. I thought. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on both both counts, and <laughs> uh, and I'm a I'm a Bill Bryson fan generally. He's written Somewhere. a number of other very good things, so I, yeah, I like so his style of humor. So I guess okay. some people think that he caused the number of uh, uh, people to head out on the trail who shouldn't be there. Yeah, I I, 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 I understand I liked, that. I liked it and recommend it a lot. Yes, I, I totally agree. Now let's get on to a bit of fear and loathing on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I want to ask you about a couple of different fears that people may have, and I know you're incredibly well prepared for this, and or you think you're pre- <laughs> prepared for this. Um, you don't know, none of us know really how we're going to face anything when we actually do encounter it, obviously. So I'm going to ask you a couple of obvious ones, and on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most fearful, rate them as far as you're concerned. So what would you think, for example, about a bear a bear encounter when you come around a corner you see a bear on the trail 10 yards ahead of you what's your what would your fear factor be at that particular point okay. uh, yeah that's that's a good way to ask that question because <laughs> if you'd asked me bears generally it would have been sort of a five i'm not terribly worried about them but <laughs> if you put it that way you <laughs> i would say you know it's still going to be a seven or eight I still think from the research I've done, some seminars I've been to, that those bears really don't want any part of us. And as long That's as right. I react appropriately, it's not likely to be, or be a dangerous situation. Yeah, I think it's not likely to be a dangerous situation. You're absolutely right. But it's, I think the thing is, the worst thing to see on the trial is a baby bear, because you know there's a mother somewhere. <laughs> and yeah. you, you, you don't want to get between the baby and the mother. That's the, that's the one to avoid. Um, and what about a snake encounter? Where would you feel you're coming around? I, I did this, literally did this. I was talking to somebody. I took one step and suddenly heard the rattle of a rattlesnake right under the rock, which was only a few feet away from my foot. When you see those, do you? because you've obviously hiked a bit yourself already, do you jump? Do you get frightened? What, what happens to you? Yeah, that's a nine or a ten for me. <laughs> <laughs> um I, you know, there's a, you know, it's only a scale of one to ten, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, I do, I do. I, I, you know, it's for that moment, and I like to ask, you know, having this discussion like this because for that moment, it's going to be really high. I can all the rationalization, you know, is something that takes a little bit of time. You know, sort of instinct will take over when it's that immediate, and uh, I, I just do not like snakes and I will almost certainly freeze and leap, you know, to avoid the situation. And, uh, Bruce, it's, it's I've met you, I've met you, Bruce, I, you, I've met you, Bruce. You're not built for leaping. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Nor am I, by the way. Well, yeah, we'll see how good adrenaline works. Uh, you know, <laughs> even in a big guy. But, uh, oh, you know, that's one of those fears that no matter how much planning I do and how much yeah. thinking I do and how much rationalization, I sort of import to deal with that situation. I think it's going to be so immediate that I am going to be fearful. Yeah, yeah. Have you had had snake encounters? I presume you have had snake encounters in the past. Any have, any, any dangerous ones? Any any you've come very close no. accidentally? No, um, it, cl- closer than I wanted to. I can't <laughs> say something ever leaped at me to bite me, or I had stepped within a foot of it, but. Certainly, I've stepped within, you know, six feet of one and sort of recoiled back. Yeah, yeah. As did the snake, no doubt. Because <laughs> they, <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't want any, any part of you either. I think this is the same with animals in general. We're, we're in their place. They're not in our place. You know, this is where they live. We're just visiting. And so I, I, I would always try to stay out of the way. I wouldn't get in their way at all. What about other animals? I know we came, we, we were coming down a, a hill in Maine, not in Maine, in New Hampshire, and we suddenly uh, we, we suddenly saw a moose directly on the trail right in front of us. And I've got a video of me filming it as well, which is awesome to see. Um, have you seen moose? Have you seen the other animals in the wild, wild that might give you pause? Um, I've actually seen a lot of moose um, because, huh. as you may recall, course, I spent yeah. two summers in the North Maine woods 
Yeah. And um, I did have to, admittedly, I saw more moose from inside a canoe than I did see on a hiking trail. But I've seen enough, and I've actually gone out with groups to look for them early in the morning, that I have uh, this built-in comfort, which may be uh, irrational, but I <laughs> don't have any fear uh, of the moose. I certainly don't want to... Uh, be in their way if they're running down the trail but yeah. i do think they're probably easy, easy to evade aren't they a great sight though don't you think that there's something other world otherworldly about them you know i love them and there's it's almost this part of my youth in fact we were looking over our christmas tree a few days ago and my wife had put on this ornament of a moose that she'd given me years ago to oh. sort of remember my love of the outdoors and my particular interest in moose and maine Ah, uh, awesome. Now, uh, what about the smallest of animals, the ticks? What are you going to have? You do you know how to prepare for that? What you know? I mean, I know you know you know you meant to inspect your body regularly. Um, have you been bitten by these things at all? Not to my knowledge. I do. I do worry a little bit about them. I, my it was it was really good to hear on your Mighty Blue podcast the doc spot about the ticks and yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean you really reduce your. Uh, care of your body relating yeah. to ticks but it was nice to hear that maybe the, the odds of having a uh, bad uh, incident is relatively low that said the only thing i'm really planning to do for ticks is to bring a tick remover and to you know review you know my body so that i can make sure i don't leave any on myself yeah you, you, you're gonna grow a beard when you're away, you, you know, was, you know, a lot, of the, I, a lot of the young lads grow beards and that, and of course the tick can get in there do. quite easily. I, you don't, you, I don't think you want to see me with a beard. I, I um, <laughs> I've always had a fairly light, sort of spotty beard, so I've never grown one. It wouldn't look very good. So um, one of the weight penalties I'm probably going to have is I will carry a you know, little plastic razor and <laughs> probably, probably just hit, you know, hit my face every third day or second oh, day. I see. I, I literally, even today, shave without shaving cream, just with hot water. So oh, wow. I have a pretty easy beard to maintain. <laughs> so bears are about five unless you're coming, unless they come in your path and, and they become a seven or eight. Snakes are a nine or a ten, whatever. What about the fear of just not enjoying it? Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things I worry about. And I know we've talked a little bit about boredom and how – uh, one particular uh, listener, uh, uh, I think I, uh, Mighty Blue Podcast, said she could never remember a day being bored. I think you had a similar experience. I am yeah. worried that the number of days out there and doing relatively the same thing uh, might bring on a period of boredom or monotony related to boredom. And th that's one thing that, you know, you know, ultimately, when I think about the worst fears to me, you know, as a lawyer, I almost was thinking to myself, I need you to define fear before I answer your question. <laughs> um, but to me, the biggest fear, or the way I would define fear, is those things that would cause me to sort of get off the trail. But there are these sort of incidental fears, like bears and snakes, that are very real, too. That said, I worry about boredom and monotony as something that might cause me to not enjoy the hike enough that I would consider quitting. Um, I hope that's not the case. I mentioned that I did the Camino in part just to see if I could get up every day and yeah. do the same thing for 30 days. I never was bored there. A uh, very different experience in some respects, but I still was doing the same thing, hiking every day with a pack on my back. And I, I think there can be a few days where there's the sameness, nothing particularly new or exciting going on. Maybe the weather's been particularly bad and... I think I'll fight some of those temptations. Yeah. I think the weather is one of the big factors of not enjoying your day. You know, you, you you do get fed up in the end of just being poured upon relentlessly. But I I, I think that th this boredom thing, it struck me. I've heard of more and more people recently talk about boredom on the trail. And I'm not sure I was ever bored at all. It was just there was always something to look at and this great feeling of actually being out in the open air and being... 
in a healthy condition because your blood you talked about your blood pressure earlier on your blood pressure is going to go down you're going to be fine you know you'll, you'll get yourself fitter and healthier than you've ever been in your life that in itself is a wonderful thing all the endorphins are rushing through you and so on um and so boredom isn't the thing the other reason the other thing of course uh, which will be the possibility of not finishing for any reason do you worry about not finishing at all sure you know, if I was had one or one or two fears that might be the most, and that would be the fear of not being able to complete because of illness or injury. Mm-hmm. Illness being getting giardia or norovirus or Lyme disease, and injury being kind of two sources of injury: one from just overuse from hiking that leads to a serious injury, you know, stress fracture, really bad plantar fasciitis. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing I worry about the most, and I've actually changed my hiking style a little bit, is uh-huh. falling and getting hurt to the point that I couldn't finish. And what way have you changed your hiking style then? Mostly, um, I've been much more careful about crossing streams. You know, as a youth, you <laughs> yeah, kind of good idea. love the rock, <laughs> rock hop, you know, you just go jump, jump, jump. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> much more careful, and yeah. uh, I'm really much more careful uh, when I'm hiking down i had a what i think was a great experience on a shakedown hike back in december or november when i um had two days of uh wet leaves wet rocks and a very steep uh, climb downward and uh it really made me i'm be i've been thinking much more about you know the way i would use my poles the, the speed at which i would get the care and getting good footholds because quite frankly in the past I would not have been that careful and uh, I just don't want to uh, have the type of injury that could come from a fall yeah you know what I mean that sort of thing with five million steps you just need one that goes wrong don't you really for an injury but you sure. know you've got you but you've that you've got to do the best you can and, and when I see people on the trail with no poles I, I I was just shocked. I, I I found it tough enough keeping upright with with two poles. I, if I if I could have carried four poles, I would have done. I was falling all the darn <laughs> all the darn time. But I never got a bad enough injury to sort of take take me off the trail. The last thing I, I I thought of in terms of possible fears you might have, and and maybe it doesn't concern you at all. And and it's and I in retrospect I only know this is a potential thing for to happen the possibility of a fundamental change in you as a person and that may seem unlikely to you because you know our personalities are probably baked in in our 60s i guess but there are changes that come across come over you on the trail that are deep meaningful and extended have you considered that at all Hmm. you know you know i figure it's hard to do an adventure like this without affecting you somehow um yeah. but that's a good good question let's put it this way i'm not fearful that i will change so dramatically that it would impact my existing important relationships uh, right. but that's interesting to keep in the back of my mind that i might not have thought much about <laughs> too you will become you will become an appalachian trial bore <laughs> we all are because <laughs> we can't help talking about it. <laughs> it that that never goes away you know never ever ever so you had a few thoughts about things pers- uh, certain fears and I, and I know that there are there's definitely a breakdown between physical fears obviously and mental fears do you have any mental fears that concern you mental fears i think the the big one that i uh think about is the boredom monotony you right. know being unhappy with the the hike and the extended time out there that I consider uh, pulling out of the hike. Um, other than that, uh, I don't, I haven't thought of any mental fears. Um, there's a tiny bit of fear, believe it or not, of being alone. I, I don't love being alone. It's funny. I like time for solitude and time to think, but I, I probably wouldn't be someone who would would like to do like maybe a north uh, you know southbound hike where i might be camping by myself for five nights in a row um, yeah. i tend to like the social interaction and i could if that that aloneness 
added to the boredom and monotony would be something I think would uh, impact my hike negatively. Now, going northbound, and even though I'm trying to miss the bubble a little bit, um, I fully expect to be in, with people every day. That yes, said, I'll probably have a few nights on my own, but um, those themselves, if there's a handful of them, they'll be their own interesting challenge and experiment as well. Yeah. I remember my first night was by myself. It was just over 400 miles and I wasn't in a shelter. It was just up past 400 miles. And I went to a campsite and I was expecting other people to turn up and they never did. And I was nervous, I must admit. But as soon as I got into my tent, this ludicrous this ludicrous security you feel when you're zipped inside your tent, I just felt great. And I had a great night and slept well and got up next morning, had my breakfast and went on my way. I think the trail gives you the opportunity to be as alone as you wish and to be with as many people as you wish. So you can pick and choose how you want that to work out. That, that's what I'm expecting from talking to people like you. So, you know, if you really think about the aloneness as a fear, it really relates to the one fear that we haven't talked about, which I think people don't really like to talk about. But I think it's out there in a very modest uh, amount. And that is, you know, running into what we'll call a disreputable person. And um, I, I would think if there's a dangerous moment out there is those few times that there is someone out there who really isn't out there hiking but is out there for the wrong reason. And I will say because that to me is the most dangerous in a sense that I've thought through that a lot and said, you know, there's no sense sort of encountering or dealing, addressing head on that type of individual. And one of the beauties of having everything on your back is I just said, if I ever have this spider sense, yeah, someone in camp is not there for the right reason. I'm just going to keep walking. And, if, yeah. you know, you, you know, for the most part, you know, if you walk another mile or two or three and you can put your tent up almost anywhere. So that would be the one fear that I have that my antenna will be up from time to time. But I'd like to think that I've thought through how to deal with it. So it doesn't create a more, uh, dangerous moment you know my, my my personal impression of of the trial was that i mean I, I i know because i actually asked the question once did i piss off anybody on the trail and one woman wrote up wrote to me that i did piss her off and i i wasn't entirely sure why but you know her perception is her reality and mine is mine i guess and i found in general everybody i got on well with on the trail i, I thought i got on well with on the trail and if I didn't, if they didn't want to talk to me or I didn't want to talk to them, I just didn't. But you're going to find, in my in my opinion, a far generally nicer, kinder bunch of people on the trail than you're ever going to find anywhere. And you're going to find that from day one because you're all a little bit nervous in that first day. You, you all sit in the shelter and you all scooch up to let the other people in and you pass things over. And it's just... It just works. I, 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 I envy you the opportunity you're about to take on because it's going to be absolutely marvellous. So the purpose of having fear and loathing is really to say there's virtually nothing to fear and virtually nothing to loathe on the trail. But certainly in your case, snakes appears to be number one. So um, I'm looking forward to your first snake encounter. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll call you that uh, right after that episode. Please do. So please do. Record it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Matty. Well, well, good talk to you, and uh, we'll catch up again soon, right? All right. Very good, Steve. As always, thanks. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> For a moment there, when he mentioned a fear that people don't like to talk about, I braced myself. I was sure he was going to talk about privies. Happily, for those of us eating... He didn't. And that thing about Bill Bryson, it is real. Opinion is so divided. As I've said before, A Walk in the Woods was the book that planted the Appalachian Trail in my mind back in the late 90s, so I'll be forever grateful for it, and for Bill Bryson. I met many people on the trail who were similarly motivated. Yet, at some shelters, you would have thought that Bryson was a bloody serial killer. It's a funny book. He didn't claim to do the whole thing. I think that the worst thing that happened to the book was that awful film they made of it. If any of you out there are film directors, I'd happily sell you the film rights to my story. Don't worry, I'm very cheap and very negotiable. Seriously though, a good film about a through hike would be wonderful. Those of us who have done it would wallow in it, and those of us who hadn't 
would be amazed by it. What more could you want? I mentioned my moose encounter in our conversation and we'll add a link to it in the show notes. It really is something to see these quirky creatures in the wild. We had a five-star review on iTunes this week. Jash, or just a section hiker, says that he really likes RTK's very thorough approach. He goes on to say, If I thought I was OCD, RTK puts me to shame. I told Bruce that one. He loved it. Next week, we're hoping to do a bit of an experiment. I'm modelling the podcast on a radio show that's been on in the UK for about 75 years. Really? It's called Desert Island Discs, and the idea is actually my wife's idea to do this. The premise of the show is that a guest is theoretically marooned on a desert island and can choose the eight discs that he would take with him to play for the rest of his, or indeed her, life. There are a few other elements which we're not going to bother with. So I've asked Bruce for the eight discs that are important to him and I'll be playing 20 second snippets as he explains why. And one or two of them need a bit of explanation, let me tell you. You learn quite a bit about someone by the music they listen to. And if this works out well, I may even extend it as another show where hikers can share their hiking music with their fellow travellers. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. Bruce and I will see you next week.